10K. We're going to talk about does sleep apnea make you stupid? Um, starting out with just the field of pulmonology. Back in the 1970s, America was a smoking country. Both my parents smoked. Um, in the 1980s, more and more people started to quit smoking. Both my parents quit smoking. In medical school, the word on the street was pulmonology was a dead field. Only a chump would go into pulmonology because when all these people stop smoking, there's going to be nothing for the pulmonologist to do. They're going to starve. So there are two main categories of doctors. There's the internal medicine subspecialties and there's the surgical subspecialties. I got this webcam at like an angle. It's got peripheral vision but no central vision like a macular embolus or something. Uh, pulmonology, the field, is to internal medicine what ENT is to the surgical subspecialties. The pulmonologists are kind of an intellectual crowd, the, the type that will like to discuss all the details of analyzing a blood gas, ventilator settings, whether to dial up the PEEP. And around the 1990s, the pulmonologists started doing fellowships in ICU medicine, or sometimes they'd call it critical care. And I kind of felt sorry for them again. I'm like, these poor bastards, they're going to be stuck working all the night shift you know, people who work night shift get increased cancer, they don't sleep enough. And in the mid-1990s, something else changed with the pulmonary residents. They started doing more of these sleep fellowships. And, you know, I thought, what a joke. You know, being a fellow is kind of like being a servant, indentured servant or a serf. Uh, you have to do whatever the program wants. There's only a couple attendings, and they have to write you a letter at the end. And so... Um, I thought, you know, anybody, whatever I want to learn about sleep, I could read it over the weekend. Why spend one year doing a fellowship in that? But I was wrong. I didn't realize what was happening in pulmonology. There's this new tidal wave of patients called fat people with sleep apnea. And it's a big business. They routinely have Pickwick syndrome from Charles Dickens' novel in the 1830s, whereby their big fat belly makes it harder for the diaphragm to lower, and that can make them short of breath. And they've got more and more of this obstructive sleep apnea. Um, when I was in medical school, I never even heard of sleep apnea. It's a relative newcomer to the big common diagnoses. Um, it's not even in the standard pathology textbooks. But nowadays, there's tons of all these fat people lining up to get their sleep studies, to be approved for their CPAP oxygen masks at night with positive airway pressure. And it was sort of like, who needs the old-time pink puffers and blue bloaters, the smokers? You've got the fat snorers. And so what is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is usually called OSA for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, sometimes there's a relatively uncommon variant called central apnea related to the central nervous system. According to the textbooks, about 84% is obstructive type, 15% combination of the two mixed type, and 1% only is pure central. I actually think there's probably more of these central components or neuropathy components than is widely recognized because the main thing I do is work as a neuroradiologist. I still do some interventional general radiology, et cetera, et cetera, and I do some free consulting extensively about nutrition. Uh, but what I'm saying here is I look at the airway every day numerous times, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and I got a bunch of friends who are neuroradiologists, and we look at these things and we talk about it. We've never seen anything. Not one of us has seen any finding to indicate uh, sleep apnea. Now, I know there's some journal articles starting to say the back of the tongue is rather prominent and protuberant, and the idea is that during REM sleep, when the muscles of the body are paralyzed so a person doesn't act out their dreams, that the slack muscles in the oropharynx, laryngopharynx, um, allow the tongue to prolapse posteriorly, and that causes obstructive sleep apnea where it blocks the airway. Um, an apnea episode is defined as lasting for 10 or more seconds, and these sleep apnea patients will have hundreds of these at night. Um, then they tend to be tired in the daytime because they didn't get a good night rest. And they often have very uh, refractory hypertension, can require more than three meds or more to uh, try to get it under control. Anybody with a body mass index of over 25 is at increased risk of fatness. And I'm talking about somebody who's got a big BMI because they're fat, not just because they're muscular. A lot of muscular athletes will have BMIs over 25. Um, and I do see a lot of people who are relatively skinny with sleep apnea. It's not like you have to be 100 pounds overweight. Just uh, being a little overweight and a person can get sleep apnea. Usually the person who's only a little fat has a mild version of sleep apnea. Um, the nighttime hypoxia can be dangerous to their health. Depending how severe it is, it can make the heart hypoxic and that can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. It increases the risk of atrial fibrillation, which increases the risk of stroke. Uh, persons can even have severe hypoxia, and that can induce ventricular fibrillation, fibrillation and death. Um, obstructive sleep apnea patients are at high risk for early onset dementia, and that's the main reason, main focus of this talk.
So what happens at night when you sleep? The brain cleans itself through the glymphatic system, which is a combination of glial cells and lymphatic system. Uh, neurons pump out their waste products at night. They can't go offline in the daytime because they have to function. So at night, the neurons can go offline. And it's like uh, the Victorians emptying out their chamber pots into the street. The neurons will pump out their waste products. The cerebral spinal fluid around the neurons opens up and it rinses away all the waste products. So the brain is clean and it functions at its best first thing in the morning when we wake up. Uh, that's when we're smartest. And it makes sense. When does an animal need to be smart? An animal needs to be smart first thing in the morning when it wakes up, when it's hungry after an overnight fast. After a big dinner, it doesn't matter if you're stupid. You just go to sleep. But, you know, the key point is that's when you should do your most difficult work. Okay, sleep studies, sometimes called polysomnogram. The patient has, you know, oxygen saturation monitors, you know, these respiratory monitors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, during sleep studies, the blood oxygen saturation levels measure. They put a pulse ox on the finger there. It's hard for me to get right in front of my camera there. Uh, normal oxygen saturation should be around 94% or higher. Um, at sleep apnea, when a patient, you know, stops breathing, and what happens is their blood oxygen saturation often comes down. It can come down a lot. I recently was looking at the brain MRI of a guy in his 30s, and he'd already had two small strokes, and um, there's silent strokes, and that's a bad thing for a guy in his 30s. That would be bad for a guy in his 40s, and preferable not to have for a guy in his 50s. Very common by the time uh, patients reach their mid-50s. So anyways, the guy had obstructive sleep apnea. I looked at his sleep study, and he was dropping his oxygen sats, O2 sats, into the 60s. So, you know, that's terrible to be dropping your oxygen saturation in the 60s. That means his entire brain is hypoxic. It means his heart is hypoxic. This guy was obese with type 2 diabetes. His hemoglobin A1C was about 11. Normal should be less than 5.5. If it's above 5.5, that categorizes somebody as pre-diabetic. Uh, diabetes uh, with uh, hemoglobin A1C above 6.5. And so... I thought to myself, this poor guy, he's going to be demented before he's 40, essentially dead. He's half dead and he doesn't even know it. There's a lot of patients I see who are severely ill and don't realize that their entire metabolic systems are uh, quite sick. Okay, so sleep apnea is a disease I would call a mouse equivalent. When I say mouse equivalent, what am I talking about? It's hard for me to use this webcam. It's so sort of cockeyed off to the side there. A mouse equivalent means that they're like the deletory mouse. Here's deletory, by the way. Here's his book, Alzheimer Turning Point by Jack Delatory, The Vascular Hypothesis of Alzheimer. And again, I look at brains all the time. I think uh, he's got the best articulation of the underlying mechanism, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. I had figured out it was apoptosis years ago, and I wrote a book about that called Reversing Brain Disease. But I've learned a lot more about the brain since the time I wrote that book. So if I had to do it, I could write a much better book than that. But Delatore is right on the money. He did research on mice where he was tying off their carotid arteries. So that's what we got a picture of here with this mouse. And when he tied off the carotid artery, they then saw that the mouse would typically become demented about two months later. They then would do an autopsy on the mouse. And they looked at their brains. They were expecting to see a stroke, but they just saw apoptosis, meaning a shrunken atrophic brain typically. And so once you've got this model for decreasing blood flow to the brain, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion for causing dementia, one then realizes a lot of other things essentially do the same thing. And obstructive sleep apnea is a perfect example. Uh, by making the brain hypoxic, meaning having a deficiency of oxygen overnight, that those brain cells will not necessarily stroke. To stroke means that an artery is completely blocked and it dies all of a sudden. And that will cause uh, inability to make energy to run the potassium sodium ATPase pumps. The plasma cell membrane will, will break down. It'll lyse. All the intracellular contents will be released into the surrounding matrix. That'll cause a big inflammatory response. So that's why we can see a stroke immediately on a brain MRI versus apoptosis, we don't see anything on brain MRI. It's a slow, gradual death of brain cells whereby they recycle themselves and they put their contents into organelles that are then subsequently um, phagocytized by macrophages, the microglia, and no one sees anything when they look at their brain on MRIs other than a progressively shrinking brain over the course of years.
So mouse equivalents include obstructive sleep apnea due to nighttime hypoxia. And we only know this because we checked their O2 sats all through the night. Atrial fibrillation, mouse equivalent number one listed up here, means that they, you know, they lose the atrial kick, so to speak, the atrial contribution to ventricular filling, which is about 25%, so they chronically hypoperfuse their brains. Um, with congestive heart failure, decreased pumping ability of the heart, chronically underperfused brain, dementia. Okay, diabetes, the brain can be hypoglycemic at night. It used to be that diabetics would prick their finger about two or three times a day, get a sense of their blood glucose levels. But now they can put a continuous glucose monitor on the patient to monitor their blood glucose all through the night. And what they find is a lot of them are significantly hypoglycemic. Their blood glucose is too low. And that can chronically, severely cause brain damage. And I notice the majority of diabetics I talk to in their 50s, they are not functioning with a full deck. They have a very poor understanding of how sick they are, and they usually do poorly. Um, overtreated hypertension. You know, hypertension, you're between a rock and a hard place. If your blood pressure is too high, you run the risk of intracranial bleed. Your blood pressure is too low, you um, run the risk of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, and you end up like the mouse, okay? And by the way, I think uh, Pritikin thought that he could get about 90% of his patients off hypertensive meds. McDougal says something similar. Uh, Kempner had something similar, and it depends how sick, of course, the person is. But the point is, there's good reason to be optimistic. The longer somebody's hypertensive, the more they're going to have hypertrophic arteries with uh, more fibrosis, less ability to reverse it. But it's worth a try, and often it's possible. I've seen guys be on antihypertensive many, many years, and they come off them when they go low-fat vegan, but most people simply don't have the discipline or the understanding to do it. But that option is out there for people who do. Um, carotid stenosis is kind of like a mouse equivalent right there. Aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation can also chronically decrease blood supply to the brain. Uh, Post-cabbage hypotension, so cabbage is coronary artery bypass graft. When my father went for open heart surgery, I tried to talk him into vegan diet, but he wouldn't listen to me. His cardiologist told him he needed open heart surgery for coronary artery atherosclerosis, you know, the left main story. Um, they ran him real hypotensive in the recovery room, and he ended up doing fine, but they were running him about 85 or 60, 90 over 60. I, I thought that was quite low. And I asked the anesthesiologist, why are you running him so low? He said, oh, because we don't want him to bleed out as anastomoses. And so where they anastomoses where they plug in the artery, the vein grafts um, so to the aorta and whatnot, so they're at risk to bleed. Someone with severe anemia can be like a mouse equivalent. Um, also, things that increase the oxygen or the glucose demand in the, in the brain can worsen things for the brain when you've got a mismatch between oxygen demand and oxygen supply. So excitotoxins, uh, things like MSG, stimulants like caffeine. Uh, we've talked about it previously. The sodium uh, excess in the diet leads to a relative diminishment of vasodilators, potassium, and magnesium, and that can worsen all this because you're going to get less blood supply to the brain, anything that thickens the blood. We've talked about it previously, how red blood cells can be stiffened by excesses of saturated fat, how uh, many different types of fats will cause rouleau formation, sticking together red blood cells. When the red blood cells are all sucked together and thick, like a rouleau formation means stack of coins in French, they're at increased risk for uh, thrombotic complications and they have less oxygen delivery, like 15 to 20% um, to the tissues. Okay, some potentiators of obstructive sleep apnea and excitotoxicity, you know, the highway to health, hell. Um, stress, like I said, is equivalent like to caffeine, increased catecholamines, increased cortisol. MSG also increases the glutamate type excitatory neurotransmitter activity in the hippocampus. Um, excitatory amino acids also include aspartate from aspartame. Uh, tobacco is a stimulant. It also can make a uh, person hypoxic because there's going to be carbon monoxide in there from smoking cigarettes. Um, hypotension for any reason like we just talked about. Um, hypoglycemia for any reason including rebound hypoglycemia but that tends to be relatively mild in comparison with insulin-induced uh, hypoglycemia, the high dietary sodium because it's a vasoconstrictor. So what I'm basically saying here is these are all the things that are going to impair oxygen and glucose delivery to the brain or increase the brain uh, demand for oxygen and glucose. So these things can all add up. A person can, I sometimes see people have like 10 of these simultaneous risk factors being active, and that puts them at very high risk for dementia.
Um, potassium and sodium are vas potassium and magnesium, magnesium, magnesium and potassium are vasodilators. So you want those things present in adequate amounts. Just means eat plant foods. Circa inhibitors is the sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium, ATPase, and so all these heavy metals, lead, mercury, cadmium, for example, aluminum, other things will do it too. F minus, red number three. These preservatives are in a lot of processed foods: BHT, BHA, TBHQ, um, the estrogenics, BPA, atrazine, GP. There's a whole bunch of them. The estrogenics in sunscreen, like oxybenzone, also titanium dioxide, nanoparticles potentially. Anything that smells bad tends to be bad for you. Paints, glues, chlorine. You want to avoid all this stuff. Um, drinking alcohol, uh, smoking MJ, dry cleaning chemicals are all thought to be uh, circa inhibitors, meaning circa is how you pump calcium out of the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum, for example. And you want to be able to decrease intracytoplasm calcium very rapidly because it's like the on-off switch for a neuron to activate it to fire an action potential. And so if the neurons are overactive while they're simultaneously deprived of their full amount of oxygen or glucose, those neurons can die. They can go into apoptosis, gradual program cell death. Okay, hyperglycemia itself is toxic to endothelial cells, arterial lining cells, including of the blood-brain barrier. And it's toxic to the circa enzyme as well. So it's not a good thing. And, you know, of course, that's going to be primarily in the context of uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Other things that can make it worse, if a person sleeps in a supine position, they're more likely to obstruct, so they're better off on their side. Uh, sleeping pills can make it much worse in some persons. Okay, this right here is a CPAP mask, continuous positive airway pressure mask. And these things are no fun to sleep in. They work pretty well for increasing the pressure to keep the uh, oral pharyngeal, nasal pharyngeal, that just means upper airway propped open, but it's certainly no fun to sleep in one of those things. So a lot of people don't want to comply with it long term, but it actually does work. Okay, what else can you do? Uh, we talked about CPAP. Some people go for bariatric surgery. Some have the uvula, the little thing that hangs down on the back of the throat taken out. They can do even more extensive surgery of the oral pharynx, laryngeal pharynx. Some people even have to go all the way for tracheostomy. Nowadays, they got this new thing, hypoglossal nerve stimulator. I have no idea how useful that is. Um, they can reconstruct the mandible to push it forward and uh, do that as a way to have less of the tongue falling backwards. But again, the obvious thing is just lose the weight. Even if you only lose 10% of the weight, that tends to lead to big improvement in the person's overall health and function with sleep apnea. And it's obvious, become a low-fat, low-sodium, whole-food vegan. That's the smart diet for anybody who studies the subject. Um, exercise also improves the function of the circa enzyme uh, pump. Um, and also, like I said, too, you got a nose for a reason. Anything that smells bad, avoid it. Any, like these paints, these glues, these cleaning chemicals, it's all bad for you. Okay. I mean, basically, we talked about this before, sort of the Pima is just the sad diet. So anybody eating the sad diet ends up kind of like the Pima, fat and sick with a whole bunch of surgeries. Anybody who eats healthy, sorry about the picture covering up the Tadahumata, but, you know, they eat the plant-based diet. They got tons of energy to run. So here's a picture of just the magnesium molecule, how it sits in the center of chlorophyll. So it's from plants that you get your... Uh, potassium, that's where you'll get your magnesium, your two vasodilators, and all these other healthy chemicals. All right, so here's just a reference. Um, you know, Kempner had a whole bunch of patients losing over 100 pounds of weight. Uh, I got other videos on sleep and losing weight fast. Medcram has a good video on sleep apnea. So the bottom line, the main purpose of this talk is to realize sleep apnea is a big deal. Patients are dropping their oxygen saturations at night some of them quite severely, and this puts them at a significant risk to be losing brain cells, which puts them at risk for early onset dementia. Plus, we also mentioned they're at increased risk for myocardial infarction. So if you got dementia, put a lot of effort into losing weight would be what I would do, and uh, hopefully that'll help you.